Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Gisser, a board member of Asia Society, Southern California. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth program of our COVID-19 series, Making a Global Difference in This Pandemic Era, a fireside chat with Nicholas D. Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn. As we work to process the challenges of this moment, the tragic deaths of individuals of color, the scourge of xenophobia and racism, and the ongoing pandemic, it's important to maintain a focus on people at all levels of society. That's why I feel so fortunate that my good friends Nick and Cheryl have agreed to join us tonight in a wide ranging discussion, taking as its starting point their new book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope. Nick and Cheryl are Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and authors who have lived and worked throughout Asia and the world. Their work inspires people, including Bill and Melinda Gates, who decided to focus their foundation on public health after reading one of their articles. We're particularly fortunate that Jonathan Karp is moderating this discussion. Jonathan is an accomplished journalist who has worked all over the world for publications, including the Wall Street Journal, and previously as executive director of the Asia Society Southern California. Nick and Cheryl have signed books for you in advance, so remember to purchase a signed copy of Tightrope from bronxriverbooks.com. And we hope you'll join Asia Society Southern California as a member or make a donation, which you can do at asiasociety.org slash southern hyphen California. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Indeed, it is a privilege to have Nick and Cheryl with us tonight uh, to host them and to welcome 500 audience members from 21 countries. You know, you'll certainly be treated to their engaging insights and we want to engage you as well. Please uh, submit questions, audience questions via the uh, Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen on Zoom and we'll be sure to uh, incorporate as many as possible. Um, Nick and Cheryl connect all the dots for today's topic, which is making a difference. They have been doing that with pathbreaking reporting in Asia, Africa, on women's empowerment and philanthropy. And once again, they're ahead of the curve with their latest book, A Journey Through America, it's not the title, it's the subject, A Journey Through America to, um, to Explore Inequality and Poverty in the US. It's causes, it's reality, and it's solutions. And timing is everything, the coronavirus hit in earnest just as their book was being published. The subsequent economic shock, Washington's tensions with China, and most recently the police killing of George Floyd all bring to the fore many of the central themes of their book. So why don't we start there? Nick, this is a, a very personal story for you. Can you describe for the readers uh, what, you know, how you came to this concept of working class Americans walking a tightrope. And tell us about taking bus number six in Yamhill, Oregon. Sure, and uh, Cheryl and I are delighted to uh, be with you and, and Michael. We're grateful to everybody who has joined in um, at a, in a, an incredibly tumultuous time. Um, so it started because Cheryl and I were traveling around the world covering humanitarian crises elsewhere. And then we would periodically go back to my beloved hometown of Yamhill, Oregon, and we saw a humanitarian crisis unfolding there in slow motion. And so a quarter of the kids on my old number six school bus have passed away from drugs, alcohol, uh, suicide, what are called deaths of despair. And, you know, the, I think of the family that got uh, the five kids who got on the bus right after me each morning, the nap kids. Uh, Farland was the oldest. He was my year. Um, his brother Zeeland, the brother Nathan, baby brother Keelan, their sister Regina. And, you know, one after the other. Uh, Farland uh, died of liver failure from um, drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, Nathan uh, blew himself up cooking meth. Zeeland died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. Regina uh, from uh, hepatitis, from needle injecting drugs. Uh, and Keelan um, just died actually at the beginning of this pandemic from a heroin overdose. And you know that is multiplied across the country 
life expectancy even before the pandemic had fallen for three years out of four because of these deaths of despair. And so, in a, I mean, a lot of people have tried to look at reasons why the U.S. is less competitive vis-a-vis -vis Asia, vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, and all this does affect competitiveness, of course, but it also, in very human terms, affects kids on the number six bus with me and kids like them all over, all over the country. And we wanted to try to wake people up to some of that inequity and to the tools with which we can address that inequity and that lack of competitiveness. It's, it's your hometown, but not your Cheryl. Uh, you're, you're a New Yorker. And after traveling around the world and writing about the world, you guys decided to write one, a book on America. But for you, it, did it feel sort of like another foreign correspondent assignment in a sense, because of the, the heart of the book is really Nick's hometown. And then you go to other communities like that. Was this a, kind of a continuation of your, of your global travels in a sense? Well, Jonathan, so when I first uh, learned about Yamhill, I first arrived there. I am a New Yorker, and I uh, remember you know, being driven um, you know, with the Nick's parents. They'd pick me up at the airport, and we got to the farm, and I got out, and I locked the car door. <laughs> <laughs> nice New Yorker, right? People have, in Yamhill are still talking about that. <laughs> and the New Yorker habits. And so uh, it took me a while to adjust, but over the um, many decades that I have been going back to, to Yamhill every single year, I have now I'm an official Yamhill person, Yamhillite. And so I do see, uh, you know, in the beginning, I was using my foreign correspondent eyes. Um, and what really struck me is that here I am, you know, uh, when I'm in Yamhill, and I'm looking at the people around me. And I have seen so much poverty there that is just, just shocking. Uh, I have covered uh, the developing world. Nick and I have both traveled uh, and he much more so than I, but we've traveled around the world and a lot of the developing world. And we see so many people desperately trying to come to America because they believe in the American dream. And yet here in America, homegrown Americans, yes, they might have, uh, you know, smartphones or, you know, moderately smartphones, but they don't have good internet connection. Uh, and they may not have good cell service. For these homegrown Americans who are barely, you know, able to stay afloat, to find a roof over their heads, to actually find food to eat, for them and so many of them, the American dream is broken. And so this is America. It's a tale of two countries. And we saw that so starkly, and we tried to portray that in, uh, in Tightrope. And it wasn't just Yamhill. Yes, indeed, we did go to many other parts of the country. And we saw the same story. It's a tale of two Americas. And we have to appreciate that, you know, there are people, even before COVID, when the economy was a go-go economy and doing so well, there were people who were barely able to stay afloat. And now with COVID and 40 million people unemployed, that is going to be even more, uh, you know, uh, stark and severe. Right. Longer time to recover if the, the country takes steps that are, that are needed to, which is a big part of your book. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the American dream. And indeed, throughout the book, you sort of tackle these phrases that are always associated as sort of uh, givens for America, American exceptionalism, you know, the whole pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, you know, one, can you explain that? Because the, 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 your fellow classmates and schoolmates on bus number six didn't start out, it wasn't predestined that they would end up the way they did, right? I mean, this is, uh, there are certain other factors at work contributing to poverty and inequality in America. That's right. And, you know, Jonathan, I do think that actually that up from the bootstraps narrative became part of the problem. As Cheryl and I look at it, essentially the problems go back 50 years and until about, until, until about 1970, the U.S. was actually not that exceptional. Our share of GDP, uh, share of, ta of taxes to GDP was pretty average for the OECD countries. Um, our share of incarceration, uh, our health stats were pretty average for the OECD. We were middle of the pack. Our high school graduation rate was top of the, of the pack. And then 
things began to go downhill in 1970, and we steadily cut taxes, but we also steadily cut investment in human capital. And looking back, I think part of the problem was that we racialized the idea of social benefit programs and of investments in education and, and stigmatized them. And then we came up with this narrative that, you know, it's all up to the individual. It's all up from the bootstraps and, you know, anybody can do it. And my neighbors in Yam Hill and the kids on my bus, they absorbed that narrative. Mm -hmm. And so when they struggled and when jobs went away, they blamed themselves and then they self-medicated with meth, with alcohol, with, with cocaine, with heroin in ways that exacerbated the problems. And, you know, there's no doubt that they engage in self-destructive behaviors and there's no doubt that, you know, there's something to the narrative of personal irresponsibility. But if we have that conversation, we also have to have a conversation about collective social responsibility to give people a chance and opportunity to get ahead. And we're going to see that even more now under COVID because mental health is always the last, so the, the laggard in terms of how we address problems. But it's so clear that when you have 40 million people unemployed in the U.S., you know, some of them are going to be able to get back to work earlier. Uh, they'll contact their former employers. Their employers will say, yep, yep, we need you. But the economy is going to take a while to come back because people are still scared to congregate in crowds and they're worried about the second wave. So you can just imagine a lot of the people who are worried about bankruptcy or you know, not being able to get their jobs back and the mental anguish that goes along with trying to support their families. They've lost their health care. Uh, yes, they might be able to get a free COVID test, but what if something happens and you know, they need real hospital care? that is not going to be covered anymore because they don't have health care insurance. So it is so important for us as a country, you know, to really use this opportunity, this COVID crisis to make great change in this country, whether it's health care to try and, you know, give it to health care to all. You know, we do need universal health care. It's a matter of what path we chart to actually get there. Uh, but also, how do we actually bridge this huge inequality gap? so that we can have um, you know, many more Americans who are not only able to lift themselves up by the bootstraps, but also lift others and be lifted by others as well. Because we do need as many Americans you know, uh, reaching their full potential for us to be competitive in the world. I sort of feel that as the pandemic took hold, there was sort of a, a sense of collective identity that hadn't really existed for the past few years and this this collective mission to to support each other but then you have the the recent developments after the killing of, of George Floyd and I wonder how you see that af affecting policy choices or efforts to do exactly what you're saying I mean you, you mentioned the, uh, the this expression personal responsibility and in your in the story you, you know you're critical of that saying that you know that's sort of the state saying, hey, it's your problem, when in fact, it's, it should be a collective responsibility. And in, before COVID, you could argue that in a lot of ways, the state could say, oh, you know, uh, you're not a victim or you're a victim of yourself. But now people really are victims. That's um, right. So how, how do you see the, you know, the sort of the pendulum swinging? And is there any prospect in the near term of, of some of the measures that you feel are are necessary to lift people and have other people lift people out, out of poverty. So it is easier to address some of these inequities and gaps that we're talking about. Uh, traditionally, I mean, the US is just about the only advanced country that doesn't have universal health care, the only country that doesn't have universal paid sick leave. And at a time when the challenge is chronic diseases, like heart disease or diabetes, then there's less concern among elites for those at the bottom who lack health care or lack paid sick leave. But when the problem is infectious disease, then elites all of a sudden are vulnerable to those at the bottom who don't have, who have that access to that paid sick leave. And so I think it becomes easier to make the argument that we need to fill these gaps and address them. And you can also make the argument that 
for the last 50 years, the U.S. has been on a cycle. Uh, U.S. history does run in cycles, as we know, um, in which we were cutting taxes and cutting benefits, and that arguably that reached its peak in Kansas a few years ago under Governor Sam Brownback. Uh, and then schools, as a result, got so bad in Kansas that Kansas Republicans rebelled and said, you know, tax us more and elected a Democratic governor. And uh, Idaho and, uh, and Utah both expanded Medicaid. You know, I wonder sometimes if, there, if that cycle hasn't been running its course and if COVID and the challenges of infectious disease may not uh, give that a bit more push. Now, the counter argument is that even at this time when we should be united by science and by a challenging disease, we wear or don't wear masks as a badge of our identity and our perceptions of public health are very much channeled through the prism of our ideology. Right, and you know, taking this now to the sort of the global stage because the health of America is important for Americans and obviously we have to address the toll that the addiction and the mental health problems and the poverty have taken on the communities you visited on the whole country. And now we have this pandemic um, and America is weakened. I mean, even more than perhaps it was, I mean, even more than it was before. So how do you see uh, the, the, you know, the, the threat, the challenge to America's role, both as a leading economy, but also as a role model for other societies at a time when China is being per particularly assertive? Well, I, I do think that, um we do want to use this crisis as an opportunity uh, to bring about change, to make America, uh, uh, you know, strong again, uh, creating a better foundation compared to what we have had in the past. I mean, one of the problems is that, you know, as we've talked about, is universal health care. We do think that that is really important, uh, but it's also trying to support the workforce uh, in ways that actually allow people to, you know, get better training. Um, we have not been a very good country when it comes to worker training, when it comes to retraining. So there's going to be a huge need for retraining workers. Not everybody's going to be able to go back to the job that they had, as we talked about before. There's going to, you know, some employers and companies have gone bankrupt, so they cannot rehire those people. So then what industries are people going to go into? We need retraining for that. And it's something that the U.S. has traditionally just not really done done at a governmental level. They've said, oh, you know, training programs don't really work or they've allocated some money, but they've never really put effort into good training programs. But training programs are actually very effective um, as implemented abroad. And I'll give you one example. So for instance, uh, perfect time uh, to, to illustrate this is what happened after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And the auto workers laid off a lot of their workers, both in Detroit and in Windsor, Ontario, Canada sometimes the same automaker. So you had a chance to compare what happened to the auto workers in Detroit and those in mm -hmm. Windsor. And in, in Detroit, of course, the people did get laid off. They um, got s some good you know, benefits because an, an unemployment benefits were increased because of the severity of the, of the financial crisis, but they also lost their health care. And so these families had no health care, a huge burden on the family when you just don't have your health care in addition to not having a job. Over in Canada, what happened was, well, yes, they lost their jobs, uh, but they still had their health care because Canada has universal health care, has national health care system. In addition, the government said, okay, um, a lot of you, you know, are out of work. Let, let, what other industries in the area uh, can employ people? And they discovered that nursing was an area that had a lot of need for jobs. So they actually facilitated training programs for these auto workers to get trained in nursing. Now, not everybody wanted to go into nursing, but they offered them training for retraining for new jobs. And so a lot of those workers were able to just get, you know, slip back into the economy, uh, you know, with, with, you know, minimal or much less uh, trauma uh, than what happened in the U.S. And, you know, that's the kind of um, effort that we really should be working on as well. Right. In other words, good government matters. Government matters. And implicit in, the, uh, in that example is that the problem really isn't entirely, or maybe not even at its root, globalization. Yeah, I think that 
in the United States, there has been a tendency for us to be too glib about the problems of the working class simply being a tragic but inevitable function of globalization and automation. And look, <laughs> globalization, automation, they, you know, they create complications for all industrialized countries. Okay. But Germany didn't lose 68,000 people from drug overdoses last year. Uh, Germany hasn't seen life expectancy fall for three years in a row the way the US did. There really is something about, about US policymaking being, I think, fundamentally defective, about the US education system not creating resilience, um, and about you know roughly the bottom 20% or so of the, uh, of the labor pool really not being very competitive, in many cases not being functionally literate, not being numerate, um, often having various mental health or other impediments that impair their own productivity and that impair the productivity of the country as a whole. And that's really important because it gets at one of the things that we just neglect, which is early childhood education. Um, that is the time of your life when your brain is growing the fastest ever, you know, when you're a little baby from zero, the age of zero to five years. And so you want to do the best you can for that baby, for that young child, because it will affect the trajectory of their life. And so right now, um, we have huge numbers. A third of all babies are exposed to, you know, drugs and opioids at birth. I mean, it's just an incredible, you know, uh, you know, disaster. And so those kids are already starting way behind the starting line uh, in terms of just, you know, you know, having a, you know, a functional, you know, a decent brain uh, development. And so what we understand now is that if we can actually get those kids and make sure that they actually can uh, you know, be treated appropriately so that their brain can develop in a normal way. Uh, that's really important. And the other thing that uh, happens in so many, uh, you know, families with children who are abused or who are facing challenges is that they suffer what is called ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. Now, you know, many of us have had them, you know, when you're, if your parents get divorced, that's considered one. And it's one thing most of us have one or two, but when you have like six or seven stacked up, you know, in your, you know, between your ages of zero to five, that really does impair the development of your brain and also your life trajectory. And they've looked at, um, you know, research and they say that it's not only that these people are more likely to end up in jail or to have a troubled teens uh, period, they also are likely to have chronic diseases. It does affect the health. Um, they're more prone to diabetes or heart disease. And so these are real issues that have real world impacts on, on the country. So we do need to pay much more attention to that. And especially now in COVID. So you've got kids not being able to go to school. You know, this is a really important time that we need to make sure that we address, you know, those kids, they're not going to get those years back, those early years back. And we want to make sure that they get the kind of treatment and the kind of education that's really important for them. And again, this requires this collective effort on, on many different levels. And you point out in the book a number of examples in Europe, of, of, and, and you've mentioned some tonight on, uh, you know, on, on policies. What about, what about Asia? Um, what have you seen? It's not necessarily part of the book, but you have a lot of experience and perspective. Are there things that America could learn from some of the rapidly uh, uh, industrialized and wealthier uh, Asian countries, those that are on an upward trajectory, just in the, in the same areas we're on a downward trajectory. Yeah, I mean, I think that Asia has, East Asia has been, I mean, there have been many different economic models. Um, you know, if you look at the difference between how South Korea uh, developed with the Chaebol versus Hong Kong or Taiwan, um, uh, I mean, there are obviously a million models, but one common thread was a huge emphasis on human capital. Right. And partly that reflects 2,500 years of Confucianism, perhaps. Um, but it meant that when automation arrived, that Asian countries were able to take people from the villages and move them into industrial jobs and uh, dramatically increase productivity and output. And uh, I mean, I remember at one point noticing that Taiwan had more 
PhDs from American universities than the US, uh, I'm sorry, the cabinet, the Taiwan cabinet had more PhDs from US universities than the American cabinet did. And, uh, you know, I've never felt so, um, <laughs> so educationally uh, bereft as when I'm around Asia and I don't have a, well, sure, a, you know, a doctorate uh, after my name. Um, I'm sorry, but I just have to remind the audience that you're a Rhodes Scholar. So, so. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I want that Borscher. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, that I think that you also see, for example, the response to COVID. Um, I mean, certainly, uh, Asia was helped by the fact that it had gone through SARS and in the case of South Korea through MERS and was attuned to the risks. But people also listened to scientists. They listened to expertise. They deferred to it. Um, and when they have had public policy challenges, um, then they have tended to bring in smart people committees and uh, really try to, you know, to, to go forward with them. And the result has been, I think, you know, quite good governance um, and, um, and exceptionally good investments in human capital. And in the long run, I think that's a really good reason to be optimistic about the future of Asia. Right, the human capital investment comes early and the PhDs come from America, <laughs> um, at, at least for now. I mean, I wonder to what extent uh, this pandemic will change that and also to what extent the pandemic changes national policies, particularly in China or whatever on this. So how do you see that? Do you, you know, a big part of the book is also about how loneliness, the loneliness of these communities, of these people, how it's not just a, it's not just a figurative expression. It's actually, I think you quote the, one of the former Surgeon Generals and he, he says it's a pathology, um, but on a national level, do you see that pathology taking hold? Um, nationalist governments, disengagement, perhaps, more uh, aggressive postures toward neighbors, I mean, particularly in Asia, if you could address that. Well, certainly in Asia, um, I think that, uh, well, our, we have, I think we, it's better to look at pre-COVID and post-COVID because I think pre-COVID, um, you know, China, S South Korea, and, and Asia, they all have institutions, civil institutions. And, you know, I think society is, is very communal, uh, uh, much more so than actually here. Japan, for instance, is extremely communal, uh, much more so than in the U.S., where we celebrate individual rights. Uh, you know, the Confucian, the Asian model is much more, you know, the community rather than individual rights. They, they're not very litigious in the same way that we are here in the U.S., so here in the US, I do worry that one of the problems is that, um, for instance, our Congress has more lawyers, whereas in China, the Politburo has more engineers. And so they actually wanna do things and create things and make things work. Whereas here, we're, we're much more litigious. You know, we just, we're built on a rule of law, which is excellent, but it also means that, you know, people are more, you know, uh, quick to sue. Uh, but I think that, um, what's important about the issue of isolation now because of COVID is that we do risk a higher level of loneliness. Already the suicide rate even before COVID was at you know, record highs since World War II. Uh, you know, people were, you know, the deaths of despair uh, that basically were uh, something that uh, two Princeton economists had looked at uh, from the census data and they discovered that uh, the working class Americans were having, were, their mortality rates were rising. Everyone else's mortality rates are falling. We are living longer. Science is letting us live longer. But the mortality rates for the working class Americans were rising. And the main three reasons were, which they called the deaths of despair, deaths from alcohol related diseases, deaths from overdose, drug overdose related, and death from suicide you know, the, the suicide rates are really high. And so now we have a situation where people are forced to do some sort of isolation, social distancing, which makes people even more sort of potentially lonely. And so we are going to have, I, I would not be surprised if we're going to see a, a larger epidemic of loneliness uh, as an outcome of what's happening now. And I think, you know, look, people, people, we're social human beings, and I think we do like to congregate. And so part of you know, 
the protests are terrible. I mean, I mean, the peaceful protests are fine, but the riot rioting is terrible. And so there is this sense that people, you know, feel the frustration of, of being cooped up at home and, and not being able to go out and congregate and have parties and celebrate birthdays or weddings. And, and so I think that there's pent up loneliness that we're going to see more of. The, um, I, I wanted to uh, throw in an audience question here because it, 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 it goes back to the China, the relationship with China. Um, uh, it's, the question uh, says, regarding the recent policies that the U.S. has made in, in the scientific field, you know, technology, especially related to China, um, do you perceive that there will be a decoupling of science and technology between the U.S. and China, and perhaps in areas that could contribute to solving some of these public health issues? I'm afraid that there will be and that uh, we are going to see it. I'm afraid that relations between the U.S. and China are going to get worse in this election year. I think President Trump has decided that he's best off politically running against Xi Jinping and um, that you know he will tar Joe Biden as uh, basically an ally of Xi and that uh, Biden will respond by saying, no, you're the one who like Xi Jinping, and, and that the result may be a certain amount of uh, growing animus between the two countries. Meanwhile, you know, we also see, um, I think, some rising nationalism in China. And I worry that a combination of Chinese uh, conduct in Hong Kong, Chinese conduct in Xinjiang, and security issues uh, like the South China Sea or perhaps Taiwan create the risk of escalation and misunderstanding an accident that suddenly creates a crisis. You know, you remember in 2001, the U.S. had a spy plane shot down in uh, Hainan, and we were the two countries were able to defuse that crisis because Jiang Zemin really wanted to solve it. I mean, Jiang Zemin was he he really wanted to preserve that U.S. relationship. If that happened today. Um, there is no chance that Xi Jinping would return uh, that, that, that plane or that crew uh, like that. There would be, we would have a sustained major crisis. And uh, I don't think either country wants a crisis in the South China Sea or vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I think it is entirely possible we will have one. I also worry about what's going on in the field of science. And so already, uh, you know, there have been, you know, efforts on the part of the Chinese to infiltrate, you know, U.S. universities, specifically in, you know, chemistry, biology, you know, in, in the really core sciences, because they, you know, for, you know, whether it's because they want to, you know, steal, in, you know, information, knowledge, you know, of these poten potential di di uh, discoveries or, or whatever, or whether they just want, you know, to have better ties with, with experts in the U.S. Um, but there's this now this greater tension uh, around science that is really crippling, I think, because, you know, looking at ahead at who's going to develop a vaccine is going to be critical. If it is China, then ahead of the U.S., um, that's going to hurt the U.S., of course, because we're not going to be able to get great access to, to the vaccine. If it's in the U.S., then, you know, that will hurt China too. I mean, I think that it's just not good for the world if we have this, you know, um, uh, sort of really uh, despicable competition between the two countries, rather than a scientific cooperation, uh, which would really help us uh, move faster towards a vaccine. I mean, I, I think that that's potentially um, a real detriment uh, to the world if the U.S. and China cannot cooperate on uh, non-political or less political uh, areas such as science. Well, science and technology, they do seem to be sort of the leading edge of what some people see as a cold war that's, that's, uh, that's brewing between um, U.S. and China. But on the political side of that competition, um, tomorrow's June 4th, the anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre. Uh, you won your Pulitzer, your first Pulitzer, um, for coverage of that. What is your, what's your take on China's time intentions and timetable? What would slow it down? What would accelerate it vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hong Kong? Uh, 
so um, I've covered a lot of countries in Asia and beyond. And what I've seen everywhere is that as countries developed more of a middle class, as they became more educated, uh, that middle class aspired for more participation and control over its life. And that uh, dictatorships either suddenly or gradually uh, became more democratic. Um, you know, in the case of Singapore, it's been a sort of gradual bit by bit um, evolution that is still not entirely complete. Um, in the case of South Korea, it was <laughs> pretty quick. Uh, Indonesia, quick, but you know, rolling along. Taiwan, pretty quick. Uh, Thailand, a uh, more complicated story. Uh, and so on and so on. Um, uh, Burma, again, a complicated story. But I find it hard, China has been so successful at building that middle class and an educated citizenry, uh, you know, opening one new university a week, that I think it, that in some ways the regime has laid the groundwork for the peaceful evolution, the heping yan that it, that, that it always warns against. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember in 19, it must have been 1987, interviewing a young uh, KMT official in Taiwan named uh, Ma Ying-jeo. And he, uh, he then said, well, that maybe democracy wasn't really appropriate for uh, the Chinese people. And, you know, of course, Taiwan changed and Ma Ying-jeo became the democratically elected president of Taiwan. And it was easier in earlier days in China to see that process. You know, we thought that, okay, after the Deng Xiaoping generation is gone, then, you know, Jiang Zemin was talking about having uh, village elections and township elections, maybe eventually county elections. Next generation might be willing to have provincial elections that they would, you know, control and manipulate. That it'd be a process a little like Mexico's evolution. Now Xi Jinping has been moving the dial back, um, instituting greater controls, um, using nationalism as a new glue to hold the country together. Right. And I, um, I find the future pretty murky, but I still don't fundamentally doubt that equation that when, as people become more educated, more cosmopolitan, more aware of the world, that they also aspire for more participation in their society. Do you think that Hong Kong, I mean, a lot of people have said one country, two systems is dead. Um, do you agree with that? And even if it's not, Hong Kong has been in a very kind of tenuous position uh, for a year since the protests over the extradition law started. That didn't happen. Now they have a new national security law. How does Hong Kong recover from this? Can it recover and, and keep its, uh, its, its sort of unique role? You know, I think that what's really going to matter with Hong Kong is how much economic strength it continues to have, because I think that's where uh, it got its power from, and it's got its its dominance from was the economic growth and the economic, uh, you know, freedom and you know uh, prosperity. Uh, that's why China allowed the one country two systems. Now that China itself, the mainland, has become much richer. And Shanghai is a very strong competitor to, you know, in all, in all industries, uh, you know, to, to Hong Kong. And the Chinese feel as though they don't, so to speak, need Hong Kong as much for economic, you know, um, uh, growth. Uh, you know, so what, what remains to be seen is how Hong Kong takes that to make sure that they actually can sustain economic growth. Because I, I do think that, that China um, leadership matters. And, you know, China now has a leader who has a very different point of view and doesn't want to be tied down to some of these, you know, the historical, you know, manacles that it, that it feels it, it has now in Hong Kong. And so I think its power is going to come from, you know, butter, not guns. And, you know, I, I hate to say this because I love Hong Kong and I really feel for the Hong Kong people. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, their, their future is, is going to be really uncertain. Right. The, um, you know, I just, I actually just want to back up for a second uh, to the discussion about 
um, technology and, and Chinese, and you, you referred to the, to, um, you know, infiltration of, of universities. And I know you didn't mean this, but I also just want to clarify. I mean, the Chinese have benefited and we have benefited so much from those students, not every, you know, it's, you right. know, we, I feel like we got right. extra precautions to, to avoid any um, hysteria that may come. I don't think that's anybody on our, in our audience, but you never well, know. And also I should, I should point out that, you know, there was a Chem, um, head of the a department in chemistry at Harvard, who was arrested because he played a role himself, you know, you know, clearly, uh, you know, in uh, whatever he did in his links to the Chinese, and that was his role. So, you know, he is to blame, and he was arrested for that. So, it is really you're absolutely right. It's it's you know whatever it is on both sides, it takes two to tango in that particular situation. But, and I mean, I guess more broadly, I'd also say that I think in the U.S. right now. There's a certain amount of paranoia about China and people say, you know, correctly that uh, China is periodically trying to steal secrets. And, you know, yes, that is true. But the U.S. has benefited so extraordinarily from the infusion of Chinese scholars into the academy in the US and what that has done for American understanding of chemistry, of physics, of, of computer sciences, of you know, the broad range of, of scholarship in the US. This, um, it has been a brain drain that has vastly benefited the United States. And I do worry that our paranoia will limit that, uh, the, the, uh, a, a mutual pollination that has been good for both countries. No, no, absolutely. As is any type of cross-pollination um, in, in a sense. Yeah. It's interesting, for an example, um, I don't know yet that there's a very strong China-US um, cooperative effort on the vaccine. Whereas you do have China-Canadian cooperative efforts. You have you know, China cooperating with other uh, countries, but I think that it's so sensitive now that there isn't a really strong cooperation between the U.S. and China on a vaccine effort. So I find that very, very telling. And in fact, if Trump does pull out permanently from the World Health Organization, that will that will hurt not only us and perhaps China, but you know the developing world, which is where you focus so much of your energies and where you've exposed a lot of the, uh, the weaknesses that have mobilized the global community. What's, what, are you, what are you hearing from some of the places that you spent a lot of time, whether they're in Africa or developing parts of, of uh, Asia, other parts of Asia? And for that matter, what do you, you know, how do you see it playing out even here in like the Navajo Nation, which you've written about um, as having the highest rate of infection? So I think that there is, you know, historically there was some resentment of the U.S. for being the world's policeman, this kind of thing. And at the moment, there's no policeman and uh, people feel the absence of that. And you see that in, in health leadership, for example, that um, there's a bipartisan tradition in the U.S. of presidents providing real leadership on health issues. You had George W. Bush who transformed the situation with AIDS and HIV with his PEPFAR program, saved 17 million lives, uh, malaria as well. Then President Obama with, uh, with Ebola in West Africa. And these days, President Trump, I'm afraid, not only is not providing that leadership in the case of COVID-19, but is actually subtracting from efforts of global leadership from uh, the World Health Organization and other, other entities. And there isn't, you know, at this point, there's really nothing else that can take its place. Um, and to some degree, the same is true on, on trade regimes as well as health regimes. Uh, you, the capacity of the UN to deal with issues like climate change, that the US is kind of playing a spoiler role um, China talks a good game about filling in some of that. In the case of funding for the WHO, it, it, it will help a little bit. But China is not really in a position to provide that kind of global leadership. Um, and there is growing alarm in 
places like Africa about uh, China's intentions. Um, so we have something of a vacuum of global leadership, which is going to mean, frankly, more, uh, you know, more kids dying of COVID, more people dying of polio. One of the big things that that the WHO was working on was the polio eradication initiative that is going to be hobbled because of U.S. domestic politics and the effort to make China a scapegoat for our own failings over COVID. Right. It seems like at a very basic level, a public health challenge would be one thing that's not controversial about, about engendering cooperation, but such is the world right now, um, that, that it, it's, it's a barrier. And so going back to, you know, coming back to the states for a moment, um, you know, as in all of your reporting, you don't just, you know, portray the bleak. You, you find the bright spots and you find paths out of the darkness. And why don't you talk of, about some of the, the lessons you learned about inequality and poverty um, in the U.S. and uh, why you might have hope? Well, we have, we saw so many wonderful programs uh, that, were privately funded uh, in you know cities around the country, and if they could only um, scale, uh, you know if they could get federal funding, they could actually scale and really help a lot more people. Uh, and you know we actually can address a lot of these problems. For instance, homelessness, homelessness, and and drug addiction. Those are two of the most intractable prob intractable problems that the U.S. has faces right now. Uh, and we'll probably face more of in the future. Um, you know, uh, many years ago, by now, I think it's about, uh, you know, eight or nine years ago, uh, when veteran homelessness was a real problem. We were so embarrassed that there were so many veterans who had given their lives to help fight in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and they were homeless. So the Obama administration said, we need to address veteran homelessness. And so they created these programs that basically did just that. And we spoke to, you know, uh, a guy, um, you know, basically Private McDowell, who, uh, Daniel McDowell, who actually was in a veteran of the um, Afghan war. He uh, had, uh, he got blown, basically blown up by a, uh, by an, you know, a, a, you know, explosive device and came back to the U.S. He had some permanent damage to his knees and he was put on pain pills. Uh, and he got addicted to opioids, basically. And many people start getting addicted to uh, opioids, partly through prescription drugs, which he, he did have prescriptions for. And when uh, one doctor said, you were on too many drugs, you're on more pain pills than I give my cancer patients and, patients and cut his uh, prescription in half, Daniel went out to the streets and bought heroin. And that was the beginning of his downfall. He lost his job, he lost his wife, he lost his kid, he lost his parents, he lost his home, he lost everything. And he, his mom found him um, a place called Baltimore Station, mm -hmm. uh, which basically gets funding from the VA uh, and the government. And it put Daniel back on his feet. It gave him training, it gave him courses on how to you know, pull out from the addiction. It helped him uh, you know, uh, retreat from his addiction. And he is doing so much better. And that was a reflection of real progress because in six years, uh, the um, Obama administration was able to reduce homelessness uh, by more than half. And the Trump administration, to its credit, also continued the program and has further reduced veteran homelessness, uh, which of course is very highly you know, correlated with drug addiction among veterans as well. So we can address these issues and this is, it's just such an, uh, an example of how we can when we have the political will. And it's just really encouraging to see that, yes, we have mechanisms. This is not rocket science. <laughs> it just takes political will. So we can do this. I thought that was uh, that particular story, that chapter was, was very powerful. And I wrote down a, a quote from it because it goes back to, you know, how he, he went through this whole arc of of pain and then suffering and addiction to developing this resolve. In other words, sort of taking personal responsibility, not using it as, uh, you know, not being told it was the problem. And I think here's your, the quote is the lesson was that individual offenders, in his case, addicts or, or criminals or whatever, individual 
offenders need to embrace the narrative of personal responsibility more fully, while American politics and society should be more skeptical of it. And that's the political will that you're talking about. In other words, take collective responsibility and not put it off. Um, and you know, it's really a balance between personal responsibility and collective responsibility. We right. need both. We certainly cannot shed personal responsibility. Right. We do want people like Daniel to say, I got to take control of my life and get off drugs. You know, we need people to do that. I, we need people to say, I'm not going to quit high school just because I don't like it, right? Uh, you want to get a high school degree. But at the same time, we also need to have collective responsibility because we live in a society and we, we, we need to help people who, you know, may be down on their luck and they just can't help themselves at that particular time, but they just need a little nudge. Nudges are really good. I mean, it's a great way to try and, uh, you know, get people back uh, to where they, they should be on the tightrope. Did you find though, there are a lot of good individual examples that have helped communities do you, how do you feel the challenge of scaling those up to make a really meaningful impact on a national level uh, will be, you know, A, it, it's hard in the first place. Is, was it possible? And now with this crisis and the unemployment and the, the mind share that has to go to dealing with those problems, where does, where does that leave these programs and, and the prospects? Well, so... I mean, there's been a challenge of resources. Um, and so, you know, the feeling has been that, okay, we have some great childcare programs um, around the country that have proven that these, you know, you put a child in them and you end up spending less money down the road, jailing that child, uh, et cetera. But that it would cost, you know, maybe $60 billion a year uh, to scale it up and we don't have that money. Um, and yet I'm struck that now in, you know, in a heartbeat, we've come up with $3 trillion as COVID relief, unfunded. Um, and I think that it's a remind, you know, why? I mean, $135 billion of that COVID relief went to a program for real estate zillionaires, um, rather like uh, President Trump, uh, the average uh, break for them is $1.6 million each. Mm -hmm. And it does kind of feel to me that if we can afford $135 billion for very wealthy real estate tycoons, you know, we probably could afford $60 billion a year for uh, a great childcare program that would be a major step toward making this country more equitable, uh, reducing crime, improving educational outcomes, et cetera. Um, I, I think that, I mean, the, so one problem is resources. I, another problem that may be a little harder is education. And that's because elites, if you will, in this country, those who have made it, kind of have created a system in which they are able to transmit that inherited educational advantage to their children through sending them to great schools, giving them a great SAT coaching, you know, burnishing their resumes so they get into a good college, then into a good professional school, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm not, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, progressives of goodwill who are very ready to spend more on national high quality childcare programs. I think they may be a little more apprehensive about reworking the local school funding mechanisms that are part of this mechanism that transmits their own success to that of their kids. Right, right. So it doesn't necessarily depend on the outcome of the presidential election, although that could have a a very big sort of psychic uh, change in, 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 the, uh, in, in the debate. Yeah. yeah, but I think the bigger problem really is we have to fix the education system for, you know, for most Americans. I mean, I think that that's, you know, we're dealing, you know, this is a small, smaller issue. I think the really big issue is that um, our public school system for so many, uh, you know, American children is just failing. And you know, we shouldn't be diverting money from public schools to private schools. I mean, that makes um, no sense. And, 
uh, you know, I, I think we, we really do need to figure out a way to uh, improve uh, the inner city schools or, or the rural schools that are, are not doing, as, they're not performing as well. Uh, and we need to focus on it as a nation because it really is important for educating an entire country of people who we need to be functioning at their full potential in order for us to compete uh, against China with 1.4 billion people and India with soon to have 1.4 billion people. And we only have 320 million people. So we need every single American working really hard. And I don't think that people really get that. I mean, if you really want to compete with these giant countries, you need to have as many Americans, uh, you know, operating at full capacity, at, you know, on, on, you know, eight pistons and, and, and not just, you know, flailing about and, and, and you know, um, and that, that means stronger education. And to that point, too, you, you have a very strong section about the importance of skills trade education, um, you know, the fact that we don't have uh, apprenticeships the way that Europe has had and that not everyone is, is bound for college. And I would say the, the economic shock now is going to make that even more prohibitive for, for a lot of Americans. And I, right. think, and I think what's also uh, important, I think that one of the legacies of, of COVID is going to be that uh, essential workers, I mean, a lot of us are non-essential. We can stay home and quarantine. It's the essential workers who are the backbone of our economy. And that's the working class. That's the delivery man who is giving you your food, your takeout food, the person who's you know, stocking the shelves at an Amazon warehouse, the, the person who is you know, uh, you know, making sure that the hand sanitizer gets you know, in the ShopRite stores. These are the, the postmen who's bringing your, your, your deliveries to you. It's basically the essential workers who are the working class people who we have to take much more care of because they make the economy work. Whereas we're kind of like, you know, at the fringes. And I think that um, we have to recognize that, that these people are uh, much more important and deserve the kind of health care and the, the type of minimum wage level that allows them to have, you know, you know, a decent uh, living wage um, that uh, also allows them to have a, you know, roof over their house, over their house and a roof over themselves. I mean, there's no place in this country, if you were a, um, you know, a couple uh, working full time at the federal minimum wage, which by the way is only $7.25. If you're working 40 hours a week and you're a, a couple with two kids, there's no place in the country where you can find um, a two bedroom apartment for rent that wouldn't force you to pay more than the guidelines say, uh, which is one third of your you know, you know, gross income going to rent. No place in this country. And, and as you point out, we may be on the fringes, but we're on the fringes walking down that broad avenue of opportunity in America. And your book, Aptly Named, is about people who don't have that latitude. They're struggling on a tightrope. I'm so sorry, but I have to wrap up this conversation now. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, I encourage people to buy the book. It reveals a lot of things that you may have thought about, but not seen in, in such detail, macro and micro and framework. Um, it's another good read from Nick and Cheryl. Um, so thank you very much. With that, I am going to uh, hand you over to Charlie Coker, who is the executive director of Asia Society. And I wish you all the best on your next book project. And thanks so thank much, Jonathan. So much, we really Jonathan. appreciate it. Great conversation. And thank you, everybody, for, for you know, listening to us. And we hope you enjoyed it. All right. Well, Charlie, all yours. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to Nick and Cheryl and, and to you, Jonathan, as well, for a really insightful and compelling discussion. Um, we'd also like to remind people again um, that uh, Cheryl and, and Nick's book is available at Bronx River Book.com. So if you'd like a signed copy, please uh, contact them and you can order online. Um, we'd also like to thank our partners for this program, the Bergruen Institute, uh, Chinese Chamber of Commerce Los Angeles, the Harvard Club of Southern California, Japan American Society, uh, the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, um, the IBR MBA program at the USC Marshall School of Business, and the USC Price School of Public Policy. Um, we'd also like to um, uh, let you know that uh, we will be having another, uh, the sixth program in our COVID series,
um, the week of June 22nd, and more information will be coming out on that, which will be about the effect of COVID on, on the sports world. And, and we'll have owners from the NFL and MLS, uh, Major League Soccer and the NBA, um, talking about kind of the impact that they're having and what's going to be going on in their, in that particular industry. Also, we'd like to, you know, um, uh, make an appeal for people who'd like to support this type of programming. We don't charge for these kinds of programming, but if you'd like to see more programming like this, we'd appreciate you either signing up as a member and joining Asia Society, um, uh, dot, uh, Asia Society of Southern California. You can sign up at asiasociety.org forward slash membership LA or make a donation at asiasociety.org forward slash donate LA. So thank you again. Thanks again to Nick, Cheryl, and Jonathan for an amazing evening. And um, we hope to see you on the next one. Thanks so much.